She works at Southwest Baltimore Charter School. Good morning and welcome to today's 20 minute update BCF's monthly series of interactive calls and Facebook live streams to give you an inside look at BCF, our initiatives and the work that we do in Baltimore City, Baltimore County and the entire region. Thanks for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I would like uh, to first of all thank everybody who's joining us by phone as well as by Facebook. For those who are joining us by phone, I'm going to ask that as you sign on, that you immediately press star six to mute your line um, so that um, you can hear us, but we don't hear you until the question and answer time. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Kevin Griffin Moreno, Director of Community Investment with the Baltimore Community Foundation. And joining me today is B.B. Verdery. B.B. is Director of the Education Reform Project at the ACLU of Maryland. Uh, good morning, B.B. Good morning, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, as always, I want to thank our Civic Leadership Fund donors for their support. It's because of you that BCF can provide resources like this 20-minute update. So, today, we are talking about uh, education policy, both funding and uh, policy reform at the state level, its implications for uh, Baltimore City Schools, and specifically talking about the work and the ramifications of, uh, of the Kerwin Commission. So. I know that many of us have heard that this is going to be a significant year for education policy and funding reform in Maryland, and many of us are familiar with the phrase, the Kerwin Commission. So I think maybe we'll start just by asking, Bibi, what is the Kerwin Commission, what is it set up to do, and um, um, sort of what, what's the time frame it's working under? Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we have a slide here that's going to get put up for those of you on Facebook, but the Kerwin Commission is really the Commission on Innovation and Excellence in Education, and it was set up um, a year or so ago uh, as a follow-up to the formula passage uh, for the, from the Thornton Commission that established the state funding formula. So they're looking at how to update that to make sure that our children have the resources they need to meet state standards. And they've uh, got a pretty broad charge in terms of this concept of innovation. The commission is chaired by uh, Britt Kerwin, uh, from, formerly from University of Maryland, and 25 other uh, elected officials, policy makers, representatives of like the boards of education um, and business. Uh, they are reviewing all aspects of the base formula. Uh, they're looking at how much money should go to low-income children to serve their needs, uh, special education, English language learners. And they're also looking at things like um, the higher international standards. They're comparing Maryland children's scores to that of the high-scoring countries uh, across the world, mm. as well as across uh, the, the uh, United States. And what we're finding is that Maryland children, despite you know being number one for some years, are not doing as well as people might think. We're not scoring well compared to other states. And so the Kerwin Commission is looking at Massachusetts and some other baseline states to figure out what are they doing that we could do better? Mm -hmm. And then how would we put together funding formula that would support that? They're looking also at things like uh, teacher pay, how teachers are trained. Um, they're looking at higher education and how, um, how uh, young people would move from high school to higher ed to the workforce and what does that, uh, you know, what does that pipeline look like to make sure the kids are ready for careers. So the takeaway there for me is that uh, the Kerwin Commission is looking much more broadly than just funding. They're really looking at many different aspects of education policy, how public schools are run, how, how effective they are. Um, with regard to the funding in specific, 
uh, what are the implications for Baltimore City Schools? If you could talk a little bit about how Baltimore City Schools are funded and what they might be facing under the Kerwin Commission's recommendations. Sure. Do we have the slide up? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Well, the formula that uh, many of us worked <clears throat> that many of us worked to pass back in 2002 in the Bridge Excellence Act does. Uh, that's the Amy of uh, Bridge, Maryland. Hi, good morning, uh, folks. We're just asking that uh, folks on the phone press star six to mute themselves. Thank you. Okay. So we have a formula now that has a lot of strength. It gives more funding to uh, jurisdictions that have more children who come from low-income families that may need, that do need support, such as tutoring, uh, after-school uh, programs, summer programs. Uh, there's also a special add-on amount for children with disabilities and children who are English language learners, all of whom have additional needs above um, the average child. So if you look um, on the slide that's up for s those of you that are on Facebook, we see that there's been a, a pretty significant increase in funds from 2002 to 2008. But then what happens, and this is across the state, not just Baltimore City, is for the last nine years due to the recession, they cut back that good formula mm -hmm. and uh, funding has been flat to schools for the last uh, nine years or so. And so when you think about things like why is there a city school deficit last year and the, the big controversy and solution in the legislature that we all work to implement, the reason there is a deficit is that for nine years they've had flat funding while costs like health care have risen. So. Uh, that's uh, led for Baltimore City to a state assessed uh, funding gap of two hundred and ninety million dollars, and that's back, at, you know, from two thousand fifteen. It's even higher now. So, the state is really saying, if they had given the amount of money that the Thornton formula intended, city schools would have at least two hundred ninety million dollars more per year. And if you think about what that could buy. That could buy the after school programs that our kids are, are now being deprived of. It could be funding the arts and sports and all of the things that children need and that our teachers need. $290 million more per year. And if you think about what that could buy. Hi, folks on the phone. We're asking people to press star six to mute themselves. Thank you very much. So. We're getting some uh, feedback on the phone. Okay. So uh, the, uh, the work of the Kerwin Commission will be to look at that gap and how much funding, like Prince George's County, for instance, has uh, a gap in funding of over half a billion dollars. So they're the, the county that is as, as far away from this concept of adequacy. The adequacy is the amount of money you should be providing children to meet sta state test scores. And we know that our children are not meeting st uh, the standards that the state has set. So they're looking at what that gap is and what they can do to remediate that and then how to do the, uh, uh, the expanded programs like pre-K that will help kids start out on the good path. Uh, the consultants for the Kerwin Commission actually have, uh, said there's an even bigger gap. They're saying it's nearly three billion dollars is needed more to to provide all these services and supports that children need. So, you know, I th I th we've heard a, l a lot of people talk about the cost of education and why Baltimore City gets more money uh, than than other jurisdictions in the state, but what you're painting is a more complex picture. I mean, first of all, it's not just Baltimore City. There are um, uh, needs that, that are being inadequately met in other jurisdictions as well. And also there are costs that jurisdictions like Baltimore City and Prince George's County have mm -hmm. that other jurisdictions in the state don't. So this is more than, what I'm hearing is this is more than a city issue. This is really a statewide issue. It is, and, and one of the um, things that is good about the current formula that I hope that they'll be building on as they look to rework it is uh, it does take into account the fact that um, it's not like some other states where school systems are totally funded based on what the property tax will support, where you have just huge disparities between rich counties and poor counties. 
In Maryland, uh, our formula does look at what the county can afford. So for instance, in Baltimore City and in other less wealthy counties like the Eastern Shore and some counties in Western Maryland, mm -hmm. The state gives much more to those counties because they know that their local county governments cannot support their schools properly. Whereas the more wealthy counties like Kent and Montgomery and Howard get less state money because they have more local capacity. So that's a good thing about our formula, mm -hmm. but it needs to be improved. So in, in this context, um, with, with education reform, edu education policy uh, being so important in the forthcoming General Assembly session, what is ACLU doing to, to prepare for that? Well, we've been working for several years on this now, and we're working with our local coalition, the Baltimore Education Coalition, and our state coalition, the Maryland Education Coalition, which is the state PTA, among other groups, to sort of get a unified message about what the formula needs uh, for improvement. And uh, for those on Facebook, that slide will, will come up. So what we're, we're saying is, the commission should look at, and we've met with commissioners, we presented to the commission, and we can talk more about the grassroots efforts shortly, but we, um, the, the priorities we're That's stressing is, is that there should be sufficient funding for every child according to need. So if you have a ch children with disabilities, this is gonna take more money to support them. Some of our children are in, in you know, um, have severe em uh, emotional or physical disabilities and need additional services or even special schools that cost a lot more money per pupil. Children that are, are from low income families that don't have the advantages that, that higher income families have to give, uh, you know, uh, summer camps and that sort of thing. They need something to do in the summer that's going to stop that summer learning loss and that's going to enrich their lives and help them be prepared to meet state standards. Mm -hmm. So we want every child to get what they need by um, who they are and what they bring to school. And we one thing that we really put a lot of emphasis on the last couple of years is educating people about what um, children in schools of concentrated poverty need, mm -hmm. that those children do re really have additional needs because of the neighborhoods they come from and the trauma-informed care that they need. So we've been pushing for community schools uh, that has a community school coordinator that can bring services into the schools for mm -hmm. wraparound services like health and mental health. We've been pushing for um, after school and summer school and other enrichments. And we have made a big uh, push on full day pre-K for three and four year olds mm -hmm. from low income families. So people talk about universal pre-K. We want to push that down to three year olds from low income families because the achievement gap is starting long before kids get right. to pre-K <coughs> at age four. And lastly, the issue I said before about wealth equity to make sure that counties pay what they can afford to pay so the state can really fill in the difference for those lower wealth counties. Thank you. We're going to uh, turn to uh, um, uh, take questions from our viewers on Facebook and our listeners on the phone. If you are muted on the phone uh, and have a question, feel free to press star six to unmute your line and ask your question. Uh, and if you are on Facebook, uh, please uh, uh, put your question in the comments and uh, we will address that as, as they come in. So uh, questions from, uh, from, from our listeners. As people prepare their questions, what strikes me about um, about a lot of what what you're saying, uh, particularly with regard to concentrated poverty and sort of how jurisdictions stack up against each other, is really the the uh, very real but not very well told uh, story of of the racial implications. I mean, there are racial disparities uh, that that uh, we see in jurisdictions across the state, even even relatively affluent jurisdictions, and some of those correlate with with poverty, and some of them some of them don't necessarily do. So I, you know I'm wondering how whether it's ACLU or Baltimore Education Coalition, Maryland Education Coalition, how they are. Um, looking specifically at, at racial equity in the context of, of educational opportunity. Well, you're right, there is a lot of overlap when you look at the, where the biggest funding gap is, is in the counties with the highest number of African-American children. 
uh, Prince George's, Baltimore City, and the Eastern Shore. Um, the, that's where you have sort of both the wealth gap in the, of the counties and then also a higher proportion of children of color. So um, I think that the Corwin Commission is highly attuned to the fact that there's a serious equity problem in Maryland and they want to address this. I'm not sure that they've gone down the path as far as we would like them to yeah. in terms of looking at what this is going to mean for making sure we have um, appropriate numbers of teachers of color. So when they look right. at teachers and how they want to increase teacher quality, we want to make sure that uh, that there's uh, that that's a broad net and that we pull in teachers, uh, not only uh, students who can make the highest test scores on a certain test in high school to get into a teacher's college, mm -hmm. but to understand the impact that teachers of color have on uh, children of color in the classroom and the things that are not measured by a test score. Thanks. And, and that is something that, that Baltimore Community Foundation is particularly concerned about, and we're becoming increasingly active on this issue of really looking at the racial equity uh, uh, dimensions of, of uh, education policy. We have a couple of questions coming in from uh, Facebook. Uh, the first is, um, so the Kerwin Commission is scheduled to make its report at some point in the near future. What happens after it submits its report to the General Assembly? Well, the, the commission is still at this point scheduled to uh, do its report by December. There are uh, quite a few very large items before them that it's difficult to conceive will be settled by December. So I expect that over the coming months and even years, when you talk about how we're going to change the teacher pipeline and how we're going to totally change career technical education to make sure every child is ready for a higher ed or, or a career, those are going to be years long. Uh, phased in kinds of things. But ultimately, whatever the, whenever they do their report, it will go to the General Assembly and mm -hmm. the General Assembly will write a bill or s someone will write a, uh, a bill and present it to the General Assembly in, in Annapolis. And then we'll all have an opportunity to lobby for that bill or to change it uh, to make it better. We did have, I should, I should say, just a great public hearing, we, the Maryland Education Coalition call on the Kerwin Commission to have public hearings. There have been three out of the four so far. The next one is in Prince George's County on the 25th, so we're preparing for that statewide. But the one that we had in Baltimore last week, for those of you that came, thank you. Um, I don't know, over 500 people uh, attended. We have had over 50 speakers, and a lot of the speakers spoke to those issues like concentrated poverty. What what kind of services and wraparound services do you need to support our children? Great. And, and so somebody is going to draft a bill and present it to the legislature. What is the likelihood that we're going to see a bill in 2018? And realistically, how long of a, of a campaign are we looking at? How, how, over how much time do you expect these changes um, to unfold? Well, the... the um, the Bridge to Excellence Act was phased in. When we passed it in 2002, it was phased in with the funding and the changes like full day pre-K, full day kindergarten at that point yeah. over six years. So this is always, it's always the long haul. Uh, so right now we have 2018 as the last legislative session before we have a statewide election, as you know, next, fall, next spring and next fall. So uh, people need to be thinking about what's happening in this session what's happening during the election season and what's happening in 2019 because that's sort of the this two-year time frame for when probably the major changes if assuming there are some will be implemented and funded thanks and uh, uh, what can folks do to support some of the priorities you articulated uh, adequate funding universal uh, or expanded pre-k for for three and four year olds um, uh, focusing on making sure that areas of concentrated poverty get the funding that they need. Um, what, what do you recommend that people do to take action in the coming months? Well, I think being, um, being part of the activist organizations, and there are a lot of organizations doing a lot of work, but certainly the ACLU is a part of the Baltimore Education Coalition, and we're part of the Maryland Education Coalition. So uh, we have websites, we have agenda platforms, and we welcome people to join those uh, coalitions to work alongside us. Uh, certainly talking to public officials whenever they appear in your community or whenever you ask them to appear in your community. So there are eight elected officials on the Kerwin Commission and uh, then just your own delegates and senators and members, you know, when the 
governor comes to town, every public official is going to have to take positions on all of these issues. And every one running for election is going to take positions on issues if we force them to, if we ask them to. So where, whenever candidates are around, people should be saying, what is your position on, uh, on uh, pre-K? What is your position on increased funding? Great. Um, we are coming to the end of our 20-minute um, uh, update. I should say that um, once we post the video of this conversation on our website, we will have uh, links to the slides that folks on, on our Facebook live stream saw, as well as links to some of the organizations that BB mentioned. And uh, keep your eyes on the education adv or the advocacy section of Baltimore Community Foundation's own website, because um, over the, the coming weeks and months, we will have uh, information on what we're doing and what you can do. Um, so I would like to close by first thanking again our Civic Leadership Fund donors for making those calls possible. Uh, thank you to everybody on the line today and online uh, for taking the time to learn about uh, the education policy landscape in Maryland. It's a hugely, hugely consequential set of issues, so thanks for your attention to it. Uh, please visit bcf.org slash enews to sign up for our e-news and receive notifications uh, about the topic of our next conversation and other important subjects. Uh, and finally, thank you very much to my colleague Bibi Verdery for joining us bright and early this morning. Um, we will be back next month on November 20th for another 20-minute update. Again, thank you all and have a great day. Thank you, Kevin.